Wow, Marky, wow. Wow. Okay. Sweet. Wow. Uh, welcome to our um, international VT talk series. We have the pleasure to host Dr. Andrew Porta. He is one of the electrophysiologists in Quiron Salud in Madrid. Um, he is going to talk to us about a methodology for uh, mapping VT substrates um, using um, uh, an electrogram based approach. Um, and we're very excited to have him with us today. Uh, we've just been chatting a little bit in Spanish about the COVID situation. For those of you who maybe listened to some of our discussion right before the time of the meeting, and uh, things are looking better in Spain as he reports, and hopefully going back to normality. I hope everyone is uh, staying safe and well, and their pr and practices are starting to build up again. So, and Andreu, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're recording this talk and we will post it uh, on a YouTube channel very soon. Uh, for those of you who are live, then welcome and um, uh, we're looking forward to your talk. So uh, I'm going to ask everyone to maybe uh, write down their questions on the chat and I will moderate the questions at the end. We're going to have a 45 minute talk more or less and then uh, 15 minutes for discussion. So. Um, uh, Andreu, the, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. It, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here. I'm just going to share my screen uh, now. So uh, do, do you see it now? Okay. All right. So now you should you should see my screen. So it's it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm hoping uh, I'm sharing what uh, Alejandro was saying about uh, the uh, uh, hoping that everyone is safe and that uh, the situation in the hospitals is uh, slowly going back to uh, normal and the COVID pandemia is uh, slowly. Uh, getting under control uh, as much as possible in your hospitals and um, I hope everyone stays uh, safe. So for the invitation, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to discuss with you a bit uh, work that we've done in the last few years uh, on, on VT and, and the decrement of both potential mapping uh, as a strategy to guide the uh, substrate ablation of uh, BT. Uh, the, the outline of my talk uh, will be uh, as follows. We, we're just gonna talk a, a bit about a historical perspective on uh, BT ablation and why we need uh, a different substrate ablation strategy. Then we're gonna define decrement of all potential mapping and why is it uh, mechanistically relevant uh, for VT ablation. I'm going to share with you some in silico work that we did and also uh, I would like to share with you our multi-center validation and uh, of a deep guided uh, VT ablation and I would like to share with you some examples of of, um, of uh, ablations of patients and also I would like to share with you some experience of other groups that uh, have been doing some similar work uh, to what we uh, what, uh, have uh, done. Uh, let me just start off by saying that activation and mapping of VT is very nice and we like it very much but uh, we need to recognize that inducibility of BT is probabilistic and up to 20% of our patients will be non-inducible at the time of the uh, BT ablation. And even if they are inducible, the hemodynamic tolerance of the, uh, of the BT may be very poor. And they will need multiple inductions, they will need shocks, uh, hemodynamic support has had some conflicting results, and, and uh, we don't know if we are dealing with all clinical VTs. So uh, fast VTs will not be easily mapped. Uh, we are all aware of the limitation of, of, of phase mapping. So with that in mind, uh, there were a number of uh, substrate-based 
based uh, ablation strategies that at the time when we were designing our uh, or we were we were thinking uh, on how to make uh, VT ablation, uh, VT substrate ablation better, there were some strategies that were a bit uh, uh, and that were developed at the time and uh, were present and, and they were fine and they had some remarkable results but they were never close to what uh, was achieved in the uh, in the operating room and those were short lines transecting lines throughout the scar core isolation of the scar also long lines uh, across the scar so th those were the strategies and, and the results were quite were quite good but uh, the definition of how to interpret the substrate uh, was difficult. And, and uh, when we look at these late potentials, well, it depends on the definition that we use. But if you were to uh, annotate this late potential, you could say that this is a sharp component, uh, but also there's another sharp component here. But this second sharp component could be a bit more near field than the uh, far field that we see here, but this still is sharp. So maybe those are two near field components and they are all occurring inside the QRS. So technically, if you wanna call this a late potential, this should be happening after the QRS offset. So, uh, you know, no definition is perfect, but uh, this needs to be recognized. And, and, and uh, that, that was one of the things that uh, was then addressed, at least partially, with the lava concept. So the lava concept, the local abnormal ventricular activities were defined in 2012. And uh, lavas uh, were trying to, uh, 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 to define a, a larger uh, substrate and we're trying to uh, target all possible substrate that was present and with that in mind they came up with a definition that in my perspective it's a bit too wide and a, a bit too interpretable so I'm just going to read uh, what what was written in the paper and, and uh, lavas were defined as sharp high frequency ventricular potentials possibly of low amplitude distinct from the far field ventricular electrogram occurring anytime during or after the far field ventricular electrogram in sinus rhythm or before the far field ventricular electrogram during VT that sometimes display fractionation or double or multiple components separated by very low amplitude signals or an isoelectric interval and were poorly coupled to the rest of the myocardium as demonstrated by the maneuvers detailed below and these high frequency sharp, frequency sharp components are considered indicative of local electric activity arising from pathological tissue. So, you know, yes, this is quite sensitive and uh, it will uh, keep track of a lot of signals, but uh, it's difficult to standardize this uh, in a mapping system or uh, to the eyes of the operator. So, Lava has some pros, but also has some cons. So the pros are, are very clear. It's very sensitive and the elimination is linked to better outcomes. So this is really nice. But the cons are that the specificity for the uh, detailing the VT circuit of all those components is unknown. Uh, there is a lot of inter-observer, well, there, there is unknown inter-observer uh, variability and they spend large areas of myocardium and there's a lot of subjectivity in interpretation. Uh, it, it, and that is without talking about uh, annotation of activation time. If we consider the late potentials, they, they have some probes, they are discrete, they, they have known implication in VT circuits, they are easily and reproducibly identifiable and they are reachable targets. And, but the cons is that they, they could be missed if they are inside the QRS, they are less sensitive and they could be very different with a varying activation wave front. So, we had that in mind, and one of the main questions that we had uh, uh, when we were uh, trying to, to move this forward was, uh, is all sick myocardium uh, identified by LAVAS uh, responsible for VT 
uh, circuits. So when looking at these five electrograms, how do we know what proportion of those potentials are actively participating in initiating or maintaining a, a VT circuit? The question was a no. So, uh, uh, and, and we were confused by uh, some, by these, all these unknowns and also by having some strategies that were non-physiological trying to abolish the whole uh, possible substrate, so scar homogenization of the Bt substrate, or trying to core isolate the whole scar, which can be very cumbersome and uh, with uh, many hours of, of RF to try and abolish all the substrate. This was in contrast with some more, in our opinion, elegant, and physiological approaches to the uh, to try and treat the the PT subject, and uh, these those are a couple of slides summarizing some of the work done by uh, Antonio Barrueto in, in in Barcelona, where they were developing the scar channeling, and that was keeping track of the all all these little signals in the uh, in the myo in the uh, scar that were. Uh, identified as uh, channels and they were tra they were uh, targeted uh, just in the entry and abolished by by focal ablation also looking at the uh, the uh, ilam was trying to uh, have a standardized way of looking at the activation of the uh, substrate during stable rhythms during sinus rhythm in this case and uh, later on, we, we know now that this could be used as a strategy to guide our RF lesions. But we also, it ha has to be recognized that if you change your pacing uh, location or instead of uh, mapping during sinus rhythm, you do that during uh, RV pacing or if you do that with uh, LV pacing, those areas of crowding of isochrones and crowding of uh, or slowing of activation will be different. So that that needs to be uh, uh, that needs to be taken into account when trying to reach uh, uh, our BT substrate. Some of the things that we didn't know at the time, but now we know that they fit quite well with what we were uh, thinking, is that the substrate may not be limited to the dense scar, and that many abnormal signals may not play any relevant role in the uh, BT circuit. And those are two experimental models that have been recently been, pub that have, have been, recently been published. On the left, you, you got uh, uh, an experimental model of, of uh, myocardial infarction in swine, and uh, the authors uh, led by Katia Zeppenfeld in, Le in Leiden were able to uh, have histological samples of all the mapping points and in this example you can clearly see that there is preserved myocardium that with, a, with an area of fibrosis and some endocardial preserved uh, voltage that is surrounded by scar tissue so this could be potentially a channel and if you map that region in sinus rhythm, your abnormal signal will be hidden inside the, the far field component that is coming from this bulk of, uh, of uh, healthy myocardium that is surrounding the tissue with uh, uh, that uh, is uh, the channel. But you will need some sort of maneuver to try and define which of the, excuse me, which of these areas is actually harboring uh, 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 late potential, and, and this is an example that clearly represents how the near field and the far field can be identified by, uh, by extra stimulation in this particular region compared to mapping uh, in sinus rhythm. Also, work by Ila Danter now in, in, in Cleveland Clinic um, has taught us that if you look at the critical zone of the VT circuit in this porcine model with uh, and you compare what you see during the BT activation and what you see during substrate mapping, uh, the signals that have the highest sensitivity and specificity 
will be those that have split potentials. But if you look at the uh, sensitivity and specificity of fractionated low amplitude EGMs, you will find that uh, those have quite low sensitivity and specificity. If you have, if you look at isolated late uh, EGMs, the sensitivity will, will be way low and the specificity will be quite low too. Lava, as we said before, it's quite sensitive, but the specificity is very uh, low. So we need better targets than lava and isolated late potentials. And how do we advance in this quest for a more physiological approach to the, uh, to the substrate uh, of a uh, BT? So we need something that allows us to map during a stable rhythm and allows us to see what happens when the VT initiates. And to do that, we need a simultaneous mapping. So we went back uh, to the data set that was uh, collected by Eugene Downer in Toronto with uh, endocardial balloons that, were, uh, that had 112 um, electrodes bipolar silver electrodes very high uh, uh, very high quality recordings and they those those balloons were deployed in the endocardium of patients that were undergoing pt ablation uh, uh, surgically they had the data that we needed to answer that question we had data during s1 we had the data during s2 and we had the data during uh, the initiation and maintenance of PT. I want to spend some time with this uh, slide. And this is a set of uh, electrodes that are recording um, in one of those patients where uh, you see uh, S1 with a number of uh, late potentials that are depicted from A to uh, K as you can see here during S1, then we deliver S2. And there, is, there are some of the electrograms that have decremental behavior. You see from A to H, how there is a, quite a bit of a, a decrement from the near, from the far field to the near field, from the not, far field to the near field, you see uh, a significant, significant uh, decrement uh, of uh, activations and that is seen by a delay in the timing of activation and that delay in timing of activation is the one that is uh, responsible for uh, the development of unidirectional block that is critical to initiate as we can see here the uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia and here you see the, the whole diastolic path of the VT. So that sort of data set where you can track the initiation of the PT and how the baseline electrograms are behaving when the PT initiates uh, was critical for, uh, for, for to answer our question. So we were able to obtain voltage maps. We were able to track, to keep track, uh, as you can see in this schematic representation, here's the uh, anterior wall, this is the inferior wall, this is the septum, and you have a low voltage area, and this is a, a channel of conduction that is harboring these, uh, all those electrodes and all those signals that we see in the VT circuit. You can also, uh, we, what we did is we depicted the late potential map, and you can see here that the areas with late potentials, uh, some of them were co-localizing with the VT circuit, but many of them were not, did not have any relevant uh, interaction with uh, what was then uh, seen to be the uh, VT isthmus. This is uh, in contrast with what we see when we analyze the areas with decremental properties. And we can see here very clearly that those areas were actually uh, located, co-located very well with the uh, VT isthmus. And this is in contrast with what we see uh, on the late potential map. So we did this analysis for, uh, for six patients and nine VTs where we had the whole data set available. 
and uh, and we uh, created late potential maps, and then we are, we we created S1, S2 deep map, and we depicted the activation of the PT, and with that we were able to see which of the areas that had late potentials and deeps were co-localizing with the critical isthmus of, uh, of VT. We uh, found that deeps um, were, uh, uh, had a trend towards more, being more sensitive than uh, conventional late potentials. Uh, but what, what was very interesting was to see that the specificity of deeps for localizing the uh, uh, isthmus of the VT was much higher than that of uh, dips, and also the deep area was was much less extensed than uh, uh, was was much smaller than the area of uh, late potential. So that could be a good target for a limited subset uh, ablation. To uh, in addition to to this uh, uh, whole hard work that we did uh, in patients, we also performed in silico work. Uh, trying to answer the question of which factors influence the amount of decrement that we see uh, in, in these uh, channels of conduction in, in the middle of um, uh, an unexcitable uh, scar. So we had a tissues lab, of uh, a small tissues lab, uh, where we um, had an area of unexcitable uh, myocardium, uh, where we depicted random channels of uh, preserved conduction and with that we did some uh, work and and had one of the questions that we were asked was uh, if you pace close to the scar or if you pace far from the scar if you pace close to the channel or you pace far from the channel will will you still be uh, seeing that amount of decrement will it be different uh, from uh, in, in different conditions so if you look at the at the local uh, behavior of the signal if you pace from position one which is close to the scar but far from the channel the amount of decrement that you see is maximized but if you if you pace far from the scar and separated by a, a line of block, uh, the amount of decrement will be less. It will still be present, but it will be less than if you go if you go pace uh, and pace close to the scar. So, and this is also illustrated in position three and and uh, maximized in position one and a bit less uh, present in position. Uh, four. So decrement will be present no matter where you pace from, but there will be uh, areas that will be able to bring it up uh, a bit more than, than others. And one of the other questions was, well, if you have multiple channels or if you have you, one channel or two channels, how will this influence uh, the behavior of the uh, decremental properties? So we, we had this simulation too, and you, you can see here that no matter how many channels you have, how many opening, uh, openings of this channel you have, how long is the channel that it has to uh, conduct through, it will always have some uh, decremental uh, properties. And, and that, is, uh, that is in keeping with uh, what we see uh, in the uh, human data set that we analyze. And you can see here that the amount of decrement will not be huge. It will, it will be between 10 and 30 milliseconds when comparing the S1 distance between the near field and the far field and uh, comparing that to this, the S2 distance between the near field and the far field. So with that information in mind, we uh, uh, designed uh, the uh, multi-sensor study that I had the, the pleasure to, to lead. And we started off by um, having a feasibility cohort. So we were coming from intraoperative mapping, simultaneous mapping of the whole chamber, and we wanted to move that to a catheter-based uh, um, roving uh, and, and, and sequential mapping. So we didn't know whether the current technology was going to be able to uh, bring up all these uh, uh, signals. And we first of all wanted to have a feasibility cohort. So that, that, that worked pretty nicely. And then we moved on 
to have uh, three centers involved, uh, UHN in Toronto where I was training, Hunter uh, Park in, in Newcastle, Australia, and uh, Orris University in Denmark. And we wanted to provide a target for a more focused ablation. So the way we designed it, our protocol was, okay, let's identify the areas with decremental properties, do activation mapping or high density pace mapping in all those uh, patients that was possible and, uh, and focus your ablation on the areas with decremental properties and then test for non-inducibility after that. And if the patient was non-inducible, we would not give any further uh, treatment uh, and we would stop our ablation there. So that was the design and, uh, and three centers were involved. And I, I would like to share with you a couple of examples of how we do uh, deep in the cath lab. So you can do it in different ways, but this is the one that we see, uh, we, we find more uh, easy to interpret and easy to visualize. So obviously you can always tag the areas and we can discuss that further in the uh, Q&A period, but you can tag the areas with, with uh, tags, but it's also very nice to see the uh, activation of these, uh, of these components. And you create, first of all, a late potential map uh, during S1 and uh, then of that uh, of, of those late potentials you will uh, when delivering the S2 you will identify uh, a narrower area where uh, that has decremental properties and here's an example where you see that during S1 there uh, there's a split potential that becomes more delayed by more than uh, uh, 10 milliseconds when we deliver the S2, and this would be considered uh, a deep, and you would annotate this second component here that is the local uh, near field uh, component. So if you were to target the whole uh, abnormal substrate with scar homogenization, you would end up with a, a huge amount of RF uh, throughout the myocardium. If you want to target late potentials, you may try and, and and, and target the entrance of those channels, but you would end up with quite a bit of ablation. And all, but, but in contrast, if you want to target the deep areas, you will see that this is a much more focused strategy. And guess what? If, if you have a deactivation map of the BT uh, circuit that this patient had, it's nicely co-locating with the deep areas and, and not, uh, not that much with the late potential uh, map. Another, uh, another example, in this case, the amount of car was, was much, uh, much less. And uh, even uh, if uh, judging by the, uh, by the voltage uh, cutoff that are usually used by, with the 3.5 uh, millimeter uh, catheters, uh, you can see the late potential map, you can see that there's virtually very little scar. And, but if you look at the lay potential map, you see here two areas close to the mitral valve that uh, have uh, late activation. Those areas become much narrower and have a, uh, uh, become very uh, small uh, when you perform the analysis of, uh, of deep map. And you can see nicely how uh, there's a little switch in the orientation here, but you can see very nicely how these areas with decremental properties co-locate nicely with the area of, uh, of, uh, these, of these two PTs. One further example that I wanted to share with you that I did a few months ago in the, uh, in the CAT lab. Uh, this is a patient with an inferior MI and this is the activation during, during sinus rhythm. And, and you can see that the uh, propagation pattern into the scar shows uh, an area of slow, of, of slow conduction in, in, uh, in the base. We did, uh, we did in the posterior veins. We did mapping during sinus because of this patient had a wide QRS because of a, a non-specific intraventricular conduction delay. And you can see also that in the voltage map, this is a modified scale but the, uh, the uh, uh, voltage was uh, quite heterogeneous. So this is a difficult to, to uh, approach uh, 
uh, a scar and the patient had clinical uh, VT that was coming from this area. Then we went on to have uh, S1, S2 map, especially in the areas where we saw abnormal activation during sinus. And that S1 map, uh, uh, keep in mind that it's not the same high density during, uh, that uh, we did with sinus, but this uh, S1 map brings up a much wider area of, uh, of uh, late activation. And uh, how do you approach this, this ablation? Would, would you target the whole uh, delay? Uh, would you target the area of crowding of isochrones? Well, there's quite a few area, a few uh, of those areas with, with crowding of isochrones. So what we do is we do deep mapping and we differentiate those uh, signals that have uh, uh, non-decremental properties. And this is an example where you, do, you have S1 S1 and S2, and there's virtually no decrement uh, between the near field and the far field. So those are very difficult that they can participate in the BT circuit. And uh, we uh, differentiate those from uh, these ones that are uh, have decremental properties. You have S1, S1, and here at the end, so, sorry that this slide uh, got cut, but the uh, you can see very clearly that the S1 uh, far field and near field is here, but then with the S2, there's quite a bit of delay in the activation. So you can you can identify this is an activation uh, delay happening locally, and you would target that area uh, as a deep area. So the S1 map is this big, but if you do the S1, S2, this will take you higher up in the septum as the area of the slowing of conduction. So the S2 map will take you a bit higher, and this is an example of a non-decremental signal in contrast with the decremental one, uh, such as the one we see illustrated in, uh, uh, in here. So uh, the scales are a bit different, but this is just to illustrate that the area with the maximal decrement is located higher up in the septum. Uh, and not in the base where we also see uh, a slowing of conduction during S1. We were lucky enough to have BT, uh, stable BT induced in this patient, uh, stable but not so stable like we often see in the CAT lab, and we were able to map quite a bit of the uh, BT circuit, and we were able to find these uh, signals that span uh, a large area of the diastolic component, and you can see here nicely how the isthmus of the uh, tachycardia is co-locating quite nicely with the S2 map and, and, and not with the S1 map uh, that is taking us, uh, it would take us further uh, down here. And we were also uh, lucky to know that the uh, isthmus was uh, located around here uh, because of, uh, of this uh, uh, finding of a non-propagated uh, BPB when we were uh, mechanically uh, mapping this particular spot here. So uh, we, we uh, delivered RF uh, in the deep uh, areas and we were able to achieve non-inducibility in this patient with, uh, uh, with uh, program electrical stimulation. So we were quite happy. And the patient has been BT free for, uh, for nine months now. This is our population. This is the population that we studied in our, in our multicenter uh, study. It's a, it's a classical population for VT uh, ablation studies. Sixty five year old males, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. We included patients with non ischemic etiologies, but then at the request of the uh, reviewer, we had to ex exclude 14 patients that had non-ischemic etiologies, despite the fact that it was working quite nicely also in non-ischemic substrates, which, which may be one of the strengths of this uh, technique. And uh, we had 30% of our patients that had uh, VT storm at the, at the time of the, uh, of the ablation. And you can see here some of the most important results. So the deep areas span a much a smaller area of myocardium than the uh, late potential areas. And this is important to try and focus our efforts in, uh, in delivering uh, RF. And 
in 13 patients, uh, in 13 VTs uh, out of uh, nine patients, we were able to create activation maps that had uh, an average number of use points of uh, 485. And in those, in those VTs, we were able to track uh, the location of the isthmus and compare that location to the location of the dips and the location of the late potential. So we were able to see that the dips had a higher uh, area under the curve when having the ROC curve, and uh, they had higher specificity than uh, uh, the uh, late potentials. So the specificity, uh, the higher specificity is something that we were after and we saw uh, in the intraoperative mapping. So we were quite pleased to see that those results were reproducible also in the cath lab. As I said before, the ablation strategy was uh, uh, trying to focus our uh, RF in the uh, deep areas, and we achieved non-inducibility uh, uh, in 80% of our patients. And uh, in those that were still inducible, we did further RF based on whichever strategy the uh, operator wanted, uh, lab elimination, uh, activation mapping, uh, pace mapping, but unfortunately we could not uh, reach uh, more non-inducibility uh, despite more RF. Uh, here's a summary of the BT burden that the patients had before ablation and after the ablation and the shocks, shocks burden, so significant decrease and the uh, follow-up uh, of BT freedom for 75% uh, of our patients during uh, a medium follow-up of uh, six months. The amount of RF that was delivered was uh, 29 minutes and uh, the procedural time was uh, 260 uh, minutes and uh, the protocol would encourage to have very detailed activation mapping as we were trying to prove uh, the, the feasibility of uh, and, and the uh, use of DEEP as a surrogate of uh, the isthmus during a stable uh, conduction, a stable rhythm. We were also very happy to see that in the same uh, um, in the same issue of uh, Jack E. P. Uh, the group from Leiden published. Uh, a study that was uh, sharing some similarities with our study. They were targeting uh, the, the hidden substance and they called those signals that were uh, provoked after S1, S2 pacing and uh, by looking at the activation delay with, uh, during S, uh, comparing S1 with S2, they called those signals evoked decrement potential, so some similarities also with the name and uh, they compared the results of their uh, ablation strategy focusing on the evoked decrement potentials with a historical cohort that they matched by LB function and number of, of BTs. And they saw that the hidden substrate uh, based strategy was uh, linked to their uh, outcomes. The group from Barcelona uh, in, hosp in hospital clinic was also uh, using a strategy that had some similarities, which, which was delivering extra stimuli during sinus rhythm. This is a bit different because you cannot uh, say that this is an activation delay because you don't have, you're not comparing the same rhythm, you're comparing sinus rhythm versus uh, extra stimuli from a different pacing side so uh, but they were uh, identifying channels of, uh, of conduction uh, by these extra stimuli and they compared their outcomes not only in ischemic cardiomyopathy patients but also non-ischemic etiologies and they were able to see that the um, outcomes at the, during long-term follow-up were uh, better for those patients that had uh, 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 incorporated the hidden slow conduction with extra stimuli uh, to target uh, the uh, uh, to have ablation targets for uh, during substrate ablation. Uh, 
Uh, we were also very pleased to see that in the recent uh, consensus for uh, on catheter ablation of ventricular arrhythmias, our study was one of the uh, of the, of the uh, strategies recommended to uh, do substrate uh, ablation. So, uh, to summarize and, and to conclude, uh, the utility of this mechanistic and physiologic uh, VT substrate approach is established and, and it could evolve to be a very practical ablation strategy that is implemented and automated into uh, the 3D mapping system. And in addition to the initiation, uh, the uh, regions of deep identified the mid-diastolic parts of the VT circuit better than uh, conventional uh, late potentials. And several groups have used similar strategies with good success rates. They are all strategies that are right now not automated. So this is something that we need to keep in mind as a future uh, development of, uh, of the companies where uh, it, if, if it was possible to have this mapping done in an automated way, uh, this could improve uh, our uh, our lives in the uh, in the EP lab with dealing with those uh, challenging cases, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And I'll be very happy to uh, answer some questions uh, at this uh, point. Thank you very much. Great, Andreo. That's that, that was a, a really really good uh, talk and a nice summary of this very interesting technique, which I I think you know from what I've read and what I've heard you. Um, you know, talk to us about today is very, um, you know, it has a very um, reasonable fundamental for identifying, you know, the critical isthmus and uh, diastolic channels, which are an essential part of these uh, arrhythmia circuits. Uh, before I start with the, uh, you know, questions on the chat, there are several interesting questions. I wanted to ask you a very practical question regarding the filter settings for your ablation signal. You know, when you're tagging these deep potentials from your rowing catheter, uh, what are your standard filter settings? Or do you have a range or do you use a specific value? Do you mean filtering of the bipolar signals? Correct, correct. The bipolar yeah. electrograms, correct. So conventional filtering from uh, point, point 0.5 to, uh, so, sorry, 30 to 200 for bipolar. Okay. And yeah, so, you know, this is a great point because the, 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 the whole signal will change a lot if you change uh, your filters, uh, as, you, as you know. And right. some of the greatest signals that we have are those that uh, are obtained with the decanaf catheter. I, I'm not selling any catheter here, and I'm mm -hmm. not being paid to say that. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, the experience we have with the with the pentaray is that it causes a lot of ectopy. It's not easy to move uh, mm -hmm. without causing causing that much ectopy. I like the decanaf much better. It sits very very nicely in the tissue. It has oh, tightly okay. spaced uh, electrodes, and it does have uh, um, uh, a good maneuverability, and uh, it, it, it it works really nicely, um, you know. And most of our cases that we did when we did our feasibility study were done with a 3.5 millimeter uh, catheter. So the signals are very reliable. You just need to have uh, you, you just need to spend some more time. Uh, uh, moving around and and uh, if you can have a unipolar a unipolar um, uh, catheter that is sitting in the IBC, your signals will be much better right. and you will have uh, less noise on them and this is also something to keep in mind but we did not play with the uh, filtering of, uh, of our signals for the study yeah I think that's a very important point because obviously you know this also um, you know, facilitates a, a more traditional workflow where you don't have to change a lot of things to perform these these cases, and and yeah. it's, it's probably uh, showing some of the things that were seen on other studies using LAWAS and other type of you know diastolic signal uh, tagging or annotation. Um, and then, do you have any experience with any of the other mapping systems, or, or any of your colleagues from the other centers 
um, regarding the type of catheters and regarding the settings. So I can imagine, for example, the HD grid catheter. Again, I'm not, I'm not selling any catheters, but from personal experience, and, and I'm a big CARTO user, I've had the same observation that the pentaray causes a lot of uh, ectopy just because of the nature of the catheter, the way it sits on the ventricle, whereas they, the grid catheter being a flat catheter tends to cause less ectopy. And because you have high density uh, electrodes closely spaced to each other, um, you can even get some sense of vector direction could potentially be, yeah. uh, be a possibility. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the uh the hd grid we uh, we we did not use that um uh, catheter uh at the time of the study it was not available at the time it was not coming up so but one of the great things that has uh, uh now the combination of the hd grid plus the uh precision mapping is that uh, potentially and also now you have this this feature of the replay mode in in Carto is that you could potentially and there's something else coming up on 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 the next version of Carto called the parallel mapping. And so you could potentially have the S1 and the S2 maps uh, acquired, and then you, you have the S1, and then every eight bit you have an S2, mm -hmm. and you can go back. Uh, after you finish your S1 map and then do a remap uh, with a turbo map in precision or with a parallel map and replay on the uh, CARTO system and have both maps side by side right. uh, by filtering uh, the uh, cycle length. Um, it, it, it should work well. Uh, it's still some, it does take some manual uh, annotation and, and right. it will still. Uh, uh, you will still have to take off your glove, sit next to your mapper person, and 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 try and figure out which signal is near field, which one is far field. But I think uh, now the systems that are acquiring so many signals, they need to incorporate some sort of automation of the uh, of uh, the delay that you see to be uh, between S1 and S2 to be able to keep track of those areas with decremental properties. And I think the HD grid coupled with the uh, precision system is a great uh, is a great opportunity for that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think definitely the automation is a way forward with this sort of mapping techniques. It would certainly facilitate the time and uh, maybe even you know the ability to identify those signals quickly. So let me go with some of the questions. So Pablo Sanchez is asking about the correlation between the MRI by ADAS 3D and the hidden slow conduction. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, you know the ADAS 3D is, a, is an imaging software using you know MRI to look for fibrosis and integrate that into you know 3D mapping systems. So, so what are your thoughts on this? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah, this is very nice, Pablo. Thank you. The the uh, we did not perform imaging at the time of the uh, of the study. Uh, also, it was a time where the uh, I, I see, uh, having an MRI done in Canada with an ICD in place was not an easy task, okay. and uh, also the filtering with the uh, white band was not that clear. And uh, we, we did not uh, have uh, MRI for those patients uh, for, for our study. Mm -hmm. I know that in, in Antonio Barreto's work, uh, there is um, integration of the ADAS information and the uh, channels for the hidden slow conduction, but uh, there's, they have not systematically analyzed whether those signals uh, that have hidden slow conduction are more likely to correlate with those channels that are responsible for the VT compared to those that are bystander channels, let's put it this way. So as far as I know, there's no functional uh, study done um, with, with MRI data. And this is something that could be uh, uh, that could be very interesting to look at. 
Right, and then there's another question from Duran Aras regarding this as well. He's asking which one is more specific for a critical isthmus assessment, the deep mapping or the ILAM? Um, yeah. And I so, think you answered that question yeah. to some extent on your talk. Mm, yeah, one, one of the things that I, I really like the ILAM for, for Two main reasons is is a, is a standard way of looking at the propagation into the scar. So it it removes from our mind the voltage cutoffs that are you know limited by uh, using this or that catheter and and so that is just to give you the voltage, just to give you a sense of where the scar is, and that's it. And then you move towards the activation map. And ILAM is very nice because it standardizes the way you look at the activation maps. But ILAM will change if you change your uh, your uh, basic, basic style. style. And uh, it will change if you paste from the RV, it will change if you paste from the LV. So this is point number one. And then point number two is it will always divide the activation in eight isochrones. I think it's eight isochrones. So, you know, you can have a map with eight isochrones that has 100 milliseconds and another map that has eight isochrones with 400 milliseconds. Whether they mean the same or not, it's a question. And the third point is, okay, ILAM is very reliable because it annotates on the latest component of uh, the last deflection of your electrogram. Is, always your last deflection the one that is local and is the true activation of your uh, myocardium uh, it, do we know if, if if there are many components fractionated inside your uh, 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 your signal how do you know which one is local is it your last deflection we, we don't know that and uh, but this is something that is not answered so in my perspective ILAM is nice but it will it will uh, it, it I find it sometimes difficult to interpret in terms of how um, wide is your area of crowding of isochrones and how do you define your your lesion set I think deep is nice in the way that truly points out uh, an area where that has decremental properties and you just uh, have a clear target and, and that I like very much. Uh, right. Which one is more sensitive and more specific? I think uh, there's no head-to-head -head comparison and I, I, I don't wanna, uh, they, they have published a very nice paper recently and they have mm -hmm. very nice results. And, and uh, so I think it's a, it's a very physiological way of looking at the maps as well. Correct, yeah. And uh, um, Tolga has a question. Tolga Aksu is asking about, let me read this question carefully. In existence of large scar tissue, ILAM map may demonstrate more than one potential target, which is true. So deep may provide a more targeted ablation. But what if the lay potential and the ILAM map indicate a limited and closer area? In that scenario, do you still check the deep response or do you try to go for those more limited LPs if they correlate with the ILAM? We try. This is a very, uh, this is a very uh, thoughtful uh, question. So mm -hmm. we focus on the area that has decremental properties first. So we target with RF uh, the area with B, and then we check for non-inducibility. No matter if the ELAM correlates or not, if it's non-inducible, it's non-inducible, and this is the objective, and we are mm -hmm. done. Okay. The case is finished. Okay, so uh, we 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 find the, the ELAM is something that came uh, up at pretty much the same time, mm -hmm. but it uh, it did not have a, uh, um, a correlation with the ISMUS at the time. So we we did not have uh, that information. So we are not looking at the uh, ELAM properties uh, with with uh, the correct. 
Um, there's another question from IVT2020. I guess that's the pseudonym. <laughs> I don't know who it is, but um, this is a good question as well. So is there a huge difference at procedural time between the deep base versus the late potential ablation? And then is there any case without baseline late potentials, but deep positive case in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, let me start by with the uh, second question first. Mm -hmm. So in patients with uh, small infarcts or, uh, or um, tissue that is healthy, right next to uh, tissue that has um, uh, preserved channels, you will very hardly see any late potential. And only by means of uh, looking at the difference between S1 and S2 during deep mapping, will you be, you, you will be able to uh, identify a near field diseased myocardium. So, so oftentimes if the scar is not big, you will definitely need uh, deep to uh, evoke a decremental response. So this is uh, for granted. Then, uh, the, the other question is about procedural timing. So we, we need to keep in mind that our, our multi-center study was the first one uh, using this technique. And we had two objectives in mind. One was, okay, we need to prove that this correlates well with the BT uh, critical components, and we need to focus our strategy in the uh, deep areas. So we needed to have activation maps carefully done and pace maps with high density and that increases the procedural time right now uh, next step would be to just you know focus on the uh, deep rf and do not do any activation mapping we have proven that it works we don't need pace mapping with the need activation mapping so that could uh, uh, and and it was not automated, so we need, we had to go one by one, looking at the signals, measuring individually uh, for the decrement with one person that was sitting in the pruka, and you know that takes time. That right. takes time. So definitely having an automation of the uh, of the mapping uh, and and not having to do activation mapping and pay, and careful pace mapping would help us uh, a lot in decreasing the uh, procedural time. Yes. So it sounds like, you know, nowadays in, you know, if you start using this technique in a more clinical setting outside of the, you know, research, stringent research protocol, if you're using, you know, turbo map or carto replay and you're doing parallel maps and you're limiting your mapping to the deep mapping rather than doing all the extra steps, it sounds like you can probably, you know, have a procedural time comparable to you know lava based mapping or elam based mapping in from what i can see yeah yeah definitely mm -hmm. um um and then i had a one last question i think this will be the last question um so you when you when you showed us the results you had about 20 percent rate of reinduction where you did additional you know, you tried other things. You went for lavas, you tried activation mapping, but you mentioned that for that extra 20%, there wasn't much of a difference even if you did the extra steps. So what are your thoughts? Do you think this was because of transmural lesions, mm -hmm. transmural um, scar with uh, epicardial substrate maybe? Um, do you have any data from your unipolar endo to think that there maybe is a, uh, an epicardial component to the scars? Because that number, you know, that 20% always haunts all the EP trials, all, all the VT studies. And when you look at most of the studies, you know, at least the first studies or the bulk of the patients are endo only, unless you're dealing with a specific protocol that's targeting epicardial substrate. But in the bread and butter, ischemic cardiomyopathies, most people are going endo. And, and you get that failure rate of 20%, 25%, 18%. Um, so I wonder if this is just not by virtue of failure of the technique, but by not uh, extending into the epicardial side of the scar where there could be other potential critical isma. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, um, so one of the things that was a bit 
uh, reassuring in a way was uh, was that none of those patients that were still inducible after focusing our ablation in the deep areas uh, became non-inducible targeting non-deep areas. Right. So in, in a way, th this, this is not good because you still have the patients inducible, of course, but uh, in a way, for the proof of concept, uh, it makes a lot of sense that mm -hmm. you know you are probably not reaching, uh, not reaching the areas that are critical uh, for uh, for the substrate in your first go, and you will not be able to reach them on your second go, no matter what strategy you, you use. The question we did not go epi unless we we had proof that the patient uh, had had failure before and and we we did endo cases uh, at the beginning. There were only three three patients that had uh, endo epi uh, mapping during the first case, and I I know that that some of the patients during follow up when they had recurrent uh, VT uh, underwent endo epi uh, mapping. And uh, we didn't keep track of what was happening on those procedures, but uh, because of the protocol design. But uh, yeah, so I think the the uh, what you're saying makes a lot of sense that we you're not able to reach all the myocardium that you want to on a first go if you go only endo. And in that sense, I think imaging before uh, ablation may help you identify. Uh, those patients with transmural scars and, and those will be the, the ones that more often uh, will have uh, epicardial substrate as well and they may merit uh, ablation uh, uh, or approach in the epicardium from the, uh, from, from, uh, on the first go. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, and then uh, someone just asked, is there a difference in outcomes or superiority regarding septal versus lateral scar areas? using your technique yeah so um, we did not we did not assess that uh, systematically let me go back to this uh, um, to this um, uh, slide we we did not have uh, much of a septal scar right and uh, we we know for a fact that the septal scars are always uh, much more difficult to to target Luckily, uh, we, we had inferior and anterior MIs uh, representing most of our cases. Mm -hmm. It's true, though, that the uh, amount of decrement that you see is also, um, is also uh, affected by where your scar is sitting. Mm -hmm. So if you have a septal scar, um, most of the times you will have to do some maneuver to be able to, to bring up your uh, your substrate because otherwise all your late potentials will be hidden in uh, in the far field so that is very important and i think for those substrates uh, deep mapping uh, uh, will have uh, even even a more important uh, 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 paper yeah a more important role Right. Well, um, Andreu, thank you so much for this talk. It's been very, uh, very interesting to to hear your experience on this technique. I, I certainly learn a lot from these uh, the the fundamentals and the and the, and, the, and the concept behind the the deep mapping approach. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear more about this in the future. Um, and uh, I, I I would be particularly interested in looking at correlations between you know, uh, deep mapping and imaging scar evaluation. That would be something very interesting. And then see how it performs with, um, you know, endoepicardial substrates, uh, which yeah. I think is an area that probably yeah. still needs more, um, uh, more consideration and more study. Um, I want to thank everyone who participated. We had a very good um, turnout today with very interesting questions. Um, again, we'll try to put the talks um, uh, on the web soon um, and um, let's let's thank Andrew for this great presentation and thank I you. look forward to seeing everyone next week uh, we'll have Piotr Futima talk to us about you know LV summit uh, and uh, intramural difficult areas and the role of bipolar ablation I'll be posting the 
um, the invitation uh, on Twitter, and then I'll send uh, uh, calendar invitations as well. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Andreo. I'm glad everything is going well in Spain, and hopefully we'll we'll see each other soon at a conference whenever we can go to conferences. So um, let's go for that soon. Thank you so, very much right, for the thanks invitation. Thanks so much. Stay safe. Okay. All right. Yes. See you. you. Bye bye. You take care. Take care.